Okay, thank you, thank you, Andrea. Uh, exactly, so I wanted to select a topic which is uh, between uh, classical machine learning and quantum machine learning with some connection with high energy physics. No? So thank you, thank you very much for uh, the invitation. And let me start by talking about the, the framework or let's say the general purpose motivation of this, uh, of this particular uh, research topic. As you know, in uh, high energy physics, uh, we are surrounded by very intensive simulations in order to uh, simulate the behavior of particle collisions, for example, at the LHC. Because typically, if you start to design or try to draw the picture of collisions, you can see that the system is quite complex. And uh, this requires lots of computational power in order to simulate. And this brings to a very interesting question, or may, many people have uh, in, the, in the past years, they raised this question. And it is about the possibility of select one of our favorite, or let's say the three more famous approaches uh, to machine learning and try to replace uh, the Monte Carlo simulation or at least uh, support the Monte Carlo simulation with one of those uh, different techniques, supervised and supervised or reinforced Miller. So that was the original motivation. Then if you start looking in literature, you see that um, the favorite model or family of models uh, that, that are usually uh, good for this application to replace Monte Carlo or to learn how a Monte Carlo simulation works are unsupervised learning models. Uh, as you know, those that do not require labels, uh, those that can be used for density estimation, sampling, clustering, and so on and so forth. So looking at literature, many papers appear since 2018. Uh, as you can see from the titles, uh, they are trying to use adversarial neural networks in many cases. Uh, so the idea is to train a generative model and this generative model will learn how the Monte Carlo operates and how the Monte Carlo samples. And this is quite good because in principle, we can try to reconstruct differential distributions from those machine learning models. And uh, the other advantage is that you could uh, perform transfer learning and uh, uh, train for a long time in a very good and very uh, dense data set and then propagate those changes to new processes. So you can change interchange processes and maintain and preserve the information. Um, so that was the uh, additional guess. Good, so just a corner about the generative models. So that, how they work. Uh, if we consider a very simple example with images, uh, we can have the digits, the minus digits. So they have a training set with numbers from one to nine, including zero. Uh, the idea is to have two neural networks a generator neural network, which is able to produce fake images and a discriminator network that should uh, classify between real and fake. If you make this problem and if you train it in a proper way, at the end of the day, your generator should be quite good and generate fake images with high quality. And so it's very difficult for the discriminator to understand what is real and fake. Now, if you consider this example, uh, we are talking about a two-dimensional space. Now, each, each number has uh, two coordinates. And this is quite similar to what we do in Monte Carlo. In Monte Carlo, we have observables. They are usually from two to three dimensions. So the question is if you could translate this framework in our particle physics in infrastructure. People did that in the previous papers. And uh, in particular, schematically no, is the art forgery approach you have the input distribution you generate samples and then at the same time you have a generator controlled by a neural network which generates samples and then finally a discriminator that performs the uh, classification everything that is here is classical and has been proposed in 2014 by Jan Goodfellow and seems to work even if uh, you know, training GANs are not the very, very simple in comparison to, to other models. Now, our question is, supposing that you follow all the steps uh, for the training of a generator function for the discrimination, discriminator uh, model, and then playing the game theory, so the min-max uh, two-player game, uh, could we transform or convert partially this approach into a quantum language into a quantum hardware representation. I say, why? Well, you know, we're assembling. We are learning a distribution and then generating 
uh, kinematics in this context. So you have particles, momenta, and you are trying to learn the momenta of those particles. Uh, what a quantum hardware can do our days? Quantum hardware can uh, perform measurements, can uh, sample from an underlying distribution function. So if you learn, if you teach, or if you train this uh, quantum hardware, then the quantum hardware will naturally generate samples from uh, the original distribution. And there are big questions, as you can imagine. No? Uh, obviously, we are talking about a proof of concept. No? We would like to study new architectures, understand if a quantum model is fast, if you could do it, if you could have the same level of generalization of, um, of, of a classical model, maybe with less parameters because uh, we have uh, entanglement. We may have also different uh, architectures. The second point is that, as you can imagine, we are moving slowly. Uh, in these last years, we have been playing a lot with CPUs. Many people are using models on GPUs because they are quite fast. We can do deep learning with that. Other people, in, in particular in experiments, they are using FPGAs to deploy uh, machine learning models and obtain very fast uh, predictions. So the quantum hardware in this context might be an opportunity, if possible. And finally, uh, people like to put this thing here. I also put so lower power consumption, which is at the end of the day true, because as soon as you, uh, if you have a cryostat, you put the temperatures very low, then the system operates with uh, a very amount of VAT. So it's really efficient in comparison to, for example, GPU. Now, before going into the results and explaining how we did it, uh, I want just to open a corner and talk quickly about uh, quantum computing and try to motivate the original idea of machine learning. So how can machine learning be incorporated in a quantum hardware? So just a comparison between the time scales. So in the first timeline, you see some important dates related to, to classical computing. You know? So you have the Church and Turing in 30s, ENIAC in the 46s, Shannon in 50s, and then the NP and P problems in the 70s. And today, in 2000, around 2010, we are moving towards deep learning. So many of these transitions between uh, machine learning to deep learning and uh, different models are due to technology. So we have a uh, better hardware, GPUs in particular, in 2010. In parallel to this evolution, if you put the timeline of quantum, uh, you see that quantum mechanics was at the beginning of the century. And then we have some postulates in 26, transistors in the 47. So we have a first quantum revolution that help us in the classical computation. So everything that we have here, transistors, they are a product of a quantum of the quantum studies. No? And then moving beyond, we achieve in 2005 quantum gates. So it's the first time that we have a representation a solid representation that could be uh, reproduced in a, in a lab, in an experiment, and uh, systematically. And today we are around these names here, quantum advantage. You know? So we're talking about the possibility of replace classical hardware with quantum hardware for some specific tasks. You know? So this was a paper from Google in 2019 showing that uh, there is a possibility you know, to, to do that already today. So as I said, we are moving from CPUs to quantum chips, crossing different architectures. And the, po the important point to remember, because I'm not claiming that quantum computers will change the world tomorrow or today. I'm just claiming that we is a fact that we have a transition between general purpose devices to more specific application devices. You know? So if you have a a model, you deploy that model, the FPGA cannot do more than that. You have to spend all your time compiling and then deploying this, this particular device. So the quantum chip could be seen as some, a solution like that, as it, is, as it is today. Or at least a chip that can com communicate with other uh, hardware. Short theory, as you can imagine, we are in the Hilbert space. A qubit is represented by usually this uh, pair of states, the ground state and uh, excited state. So any linear combination of zero and one will give you a direction in this space. So a quantum bit, a qubit, is, could be quite powerful because it has a continuum space of possibilities. No? It's not just a true and false, but it's really a continuous distribution. 
if you put together several systems, so if you put it together n qubits, then uh, you do the tensor product between uh, the states. But at the end of the day, you get a final state, which is a linear combination of uh, those tensor, tensor, tensor products uh, composed by two to the n complex elements. You know? So the sizes are very huge. If you wanted to simulate quantum, uh, if you wanted to do classical simulation of quantum hardware, you need a lot of memory. Because if you wanted to increase n to large values like 30, 40, you, know, you have to buy special hardware in order to achieve that. Good. So this is just a core. Now, why it's important? Because if you have unitary quantum gates, so you can have operators, uh, you can flip your state, your initial state, and apply those uh, operators and then get a new state. So at the end of the day, it's a very simple process. Now you are doing a tensor dot between your initial state, the preparation, and operators, unitary operators. No. Good. So why this is, would be relevant for machine learning? Well, because our days, there are many experiments, like uh, from, I mean, famous ones are IBM, uh, IonQ, and many others, usually companies, but also universities. And those experiments are able to apply and to implement uh, several kinds of gates. So single qubit gates, two qubit gates, and eventually three qubit gates. No, so these all, those are the most famous. So here you have a table with the different gate names and the corresponding operator, unitary operator. Example, for example, on the left, I have uh, an X gate. So this is uh, the, the equivalent of a classical NOT gate. You see here the Pauli X matrix. So what this thing does is that if you start your, state, your system at the ground state and you apply X, then you flip it to the excited state. And the, also the opposite works. So if you start from one, you get zero. The Z gate, you change the operator matrix, so you use now the Z Pauli matrix, and in this case, uh, the operator will change the sign of the excited state one by putting a minus in front, but does nothing for the ground state. Okay. So this is the very basic one. Now, if we use more interesting gates like the Hadamard, uh, as soon as you apply Hadamard to zero, we get a superposition. If you do it for zero or one, uh, it's the same. You get a superposition with a change in sign. So this is already nice because you have uh, the possibility to mix channels. Right? One step further, you can do rotations because the rotations are the basic primitives of, of operators. Now, in fact, you can prove that uh, any unitary is just a multiplication of rotations over, over different axes, not the Z axis, the Y axis and Z axis for three different angles. And this can, if you look at the formula, now you're doing the exponential of uh, an angle multiplied by a matrix. This somehow reminds a little bit the non-linearities that we have in a neural network. So if at the end of the day, we are applying non um, unitary gates that are non-linear, well, this could be an indication that machine learning has some native representation in, in, in this system. Okay, last thing that I wanted to talk about, which is relevant for us, is that uh, there are also gates uh, like the control knot that mix uh, the states. For example, in this case, if you apply the one uh, sigma x, so the Pauli x, is a conditional gate. Uh, if the initial state is at zero, zero, it does nothing. But if the first qubit, so the control qubit is at the excited state, then it flips the second one. Yeah? Uh, just a picture, so it's simple for you. Uh, if I get uh, the ground state and apply a Hadamard, I get a superposition, and then I can apply the control knot, and the final state will be an entanglement. Yeah. And this is the quite, in, say, the interesting point for us. Understand if this structure here could help us in a, in a machine learning problem, because it could incorporate or store information that is usually not, uh, not available in a classical counterpart. Great. Just to remember that everything that I said is uh, controlled and is, is limited by measurements. So everything that you do is after a measuring. So there are noise, and you should always be careful when uh, understand. I mean, measuring the quality of your final results. So if you apply a Hadamard to ground state, you might get this from an analytical formula. So superposition, uh, yeah, the superposition zero one. So you should measure uh, the state zero and one around fifty percent modulo the noise of your experiment. 
Good. Now, machine learning. Quantum technologies today are many. There are many. Those that are more um, accessible, let's call it like that, are the superconducting qubits. Uh, so what you do here is just you print a circuit uh, using Joseph junctions, and usually you insert microwaves that will make uh, the circuit behave like a, say, oscillator, a perfect oscillator. Uh, you put the temperature very low to avoid uh, losing energy. So you try to excite the waves that are generated inside the, um, the circuit. That's cheap. Uh, technically, it's cheap. So you can print it. It's very simple in comparison to a, to a CPU. Uh, however, you have a noise due to temperature, due to the manufacturing of these things, and uh, so on and so forth. The other technology, which is very, very famous, are trapped ions. Those are very interesting because you can control the, ele the electrons one by one, uh, but uh, it's difficult to find uh, large systems with many, many qubits. You know? uh, it's something that uh, people are investigating how to control because you have to uh, fine tune your lasers and all the acquisition system to manage all those different atoms at the same time. So those are two are the most relevant. The others are also under, say, studies, but uh, if you today you go to some websites from companies, you can even access and play with those machines. Just a couple of pictures. So on the left, you have a superconducting device where we have guidelines for where, for microwaves. Oh, while on the right side, you have an ion trapped technology. So you have a grid where you can in insert, inject lasers, and then you retrieve back the scattering. Good. So conclusion: we have technology we can play. There are limitations. These limitations are the fact that those devices are prototypes. Now we are playing with uh, with hardware. So we are talking about today, we can consider ourselves in the noise intermediate scale quantum here. So hardware with a uh, few noisy qubits. So you cannot imagine uh, more than, uh, you know, hundreds of qubits working perfectly. We are talking about uh, 20 to 30 qubits with say a uh, semi acceptable efficiency. And what we can do today is just to test from a theoretical and also from a practical perspective, new algorithms using the current hardware to compare and check if uh, things are working as expected. So towards the quantum machine learning. Uh, the idea is very simple. If you wanted to do learning, that means that you have a model and you have parameters and you'd like to update parameters. So in principle, you could design a quantum circuit using the unitary gaze as I showed before, variation. So you put some parameters and you try to rotate those parameters and understand if your predictions from your circuit are acceptable or are going towards your desired output. Uh, now, from a mathematical perspective, what we're trying to do is this. Now you are in a Hilbert space, which is the space of our qubit system. We start at the initial position, which could be the ground state of your qubit. And ideally, I would like to move from this initial position to a perfect optimal solution. So the square, the red square box that you see here. So what I'm asking is for a operator, a unitary operator that brings me from the star to, or very close to the red box. Thanks to the factorization, I can, in principle, write this operator, so the solution operator, which includes the path alpha that I show here, as a product of unitary gates. So if I have my circuit, I can start to plug and find a combination that uh, generates this pattern in the Hilbert space. And uh, this opens this scenario of a variation of quantum computer. So if I can manipulate alpha somehow through the parameterization of gates, then in principle, I can change this uh, optimal solution uh, trajectory and maybe get the final result. There is a theorem, which is the solovey kitaev And this theory is good because it tells us that if you wanted to, if you really wanted to do this optimization, you can get a, a set of dense unitaries and uh, you can define your circuit approximation V. So in principle, if you know that there is a solution V, you do, you create a set of multiplications of operators using K gates and the difference between the truth and your solution. 
uh, could be less than a delta. So you decided the error. Uh, the theorem tells us that the number of uh, desired or necessary gates to achieve this approximation is order logarithm power C of one over delta, where C is less than four. And this is the nice feature. So this means that you can find a finite number of gates that approximate your solution in the Hilbert space. So there is a future for this approach uh, in principle. So you can really implement it in a, in a real hardware because there is at least a boundary or a, an asymptotic behavior uh, following the log over four. So the final picture that you should expect today is something like that, where you have uh, your different qubit lines. You have an operator with parameterized by an some set of parameters that we have to find. We do the measurement, we compute a loss function, and then we can use a classic optimizer to fine tune the operator. So you repeat this approach several times as usual, as we do in machine learning. But now we are really taking the quantum hardware as our device, not a mathematical mode or a linear algebra mode. So the only difference that we should be aware when comparing classical machine learning to quantum is that in classical machine learning is quite uh, uh, cheap to propagate data from input to output. You, know, you can insert data and then you do you have your layers, your activation activation functions, you decide what to do. I mean, this is a multi-layer perceptron, but uh, usually works for any other model that we have. While in quantum, the input um, usually is very expensive to modify the ground state. So what we do is that we insert input directly into the gates, so one by one. And uh, those inputs will be uh, multiplied by the parameterization that we have. So this is the only trick that we usually use. Uh, some people call this uh, approach uh, data re-uploading because you have to re-upload the inputs several times in the different gates but to be part of the gate definition itself. And this has been proven to be quite good. So in the sense that there are papers showing um, that uh, a quantum circuit can be um, an approximate of you know, simple functions and nonlinear functions. Okay, so this is the final picture. Just to summarize, we have a gates, we have circuits, we implement our ansatz, so our model, the model performs measurements. And then at the end, you have a classic optimization that we will decide which set of parameters are the best to achieve our loss function or to minimize our loss function. Back to our business in uh, high energy physics. So what we did is this, it was the following. So we pick up the GAN model, the original, and then we have replaced the generator with a quantum generator. So everything that you see here on this right box is now quantum. So we had to define a new model, find, I mean, perform hyper-optimization, extract the best architectures, and try to understand what, what was the, I mean, what is the solution for this, uh, for, for this kind of uh, generator uh, model. No? And uh, after several trials using Bayesian optimization and also looking at the literature, we figured out that if we apply a layer, so if you define this block that you see here, dashed, uh, composed by rotations and a final, um, say, entanglement gate, which is usually is the control knot between uh, all different qubits, and you repeat this architecture several times in the in the circuit, you can get a uh, quite good result. So what we do is that we apply this particular layer definition, and then at the end we project the re the measurements into um, Hamiltonian. In particular, here we decided to use the Pauli Z. But this is up to you. There is no strong motivation to, I mean, you can change it. It's not a big issue. The main major point are the layers, you know, the, how to define this approach. If you have to move the entanglement before and after, how many uh, nodes and so on and so forth. The second point, which is related uh, to how we move the parameters is the definition of the rotations. Uh, so all the rotations that you see here, they are composed by the rotation angle and the data. So in this case, it's a generator. So the generator should receive a random noise as in the classical uh, example. And this random noise is multiplied by the parameterization by some subset of parameters that we, that we have fixed. So at the end of the rotations, 
are uh, just evaluated by multiplying the noise to a set of parameters plus uh, let's say another bias term that again is something that we that we can fine tune during the training approach so at this point you can see that uh, the analogy with uh, a classical model is somehow there uh, we have gates so we have a uh, non-linear functions activation functions that takes an input uh, parameters and eventually inputs and then we get uh, uh, all the predictions using uh, the, the, the classical approach. Good. Well, I can motivate it in further and explain you why uh, this, is, this architecture is particularly more efficient than others. But in fact, there are many, many papers where uh, there's already some a long discussion about uh, the advantages of, of using uh, this scheme and in particular of injecting the integument at the end. So I'm just skipping that, but I wanted to show some validation results using first a simulation and then uh, Monte Carlo data from high energy physics. First example is very simple. We take a uh, uh, 1D gamma distribution. We sample from uh, the original PDF distribution. So here you have, uh, for example, 10 to the four samples in red. So you get this distribution. And then after training our model, using just a single qubit, a single layer, you can see the blue curve. Now we can get the, the blue curve. And in particular, if you increase the number of samples, so if you train on 10 to the four, but then you sample to 10 to the five, the output of the quantum gam is quite good. I mean, it's acceptable in the low regime where there is a lot of statistics. And then also when getting to high values in X, uh, the fluctuations are there, but the model, let's say, learns somehow the underlying distribution. So this is the first one, very simple, just a single qubit. So we are using, I mean, any computer, any quantum computer has this feature. Then the second model, which is slightly more complicated for the for the architecture, is to train a three-dimensional Gaussian with correlations. So usual Gaussian centered with uh, some uh, correlation matrix. And here you have the simulation results using three qubits, 100 pins uh, for the reference and the generator number. Now, so you have all the different uh, projections. And again, also in this case, the results are very good, very compatible. If you plot the two dimensional projections, you can see that the correlations are also preserved. And if you do the ratio to the reference, also here, the quality is quite good. Obviously, very, very good when the distribution is high and then it starts deteriorating as soon as you have the cues, that's, that's normal. So. We can do that, so you can train a three qubit system to do this uh, this particular sampling. Everything that I'm showing here is simulation, so we are doing classical simulation of the of these different systems. Now, we wanted to do another example using a more realistic data set. So we took the TT bar uh, simulation from our graph, and we have plotted the Mandelstam variables st and rapidity, doing exactly the same as before. So three qubits. And these are these are the results. So we can have the S, the T, and the Y distributions. We can compare the reference to the generators, and also here the quality is quite quite good. In particular, if you if you plot the correlations, so if you put the S and T, you see that uh, all the dispersion is very very well reproduced, and uh, correlations are well captured at the end. Even if we do the ratios, we can get a quite uh, quite good results. And finally, so I think the last question that we may, may ask is what happens if you take now this model and you try to deploy on um, IBM or IonQ or any other uh, provider you know, for quantum chips? So if you move to real quantum hardware, uh, then the, the, the solution or the, the answer to this question is this example. We have uh, the IBM Santiago with five qubits. We try to deploy our model. And as you can see, the quality is somehow not so good as uh, the simulation, but in overall, the distributions, they look quite similar to the simulation. So you can preserve correlations. We can uh, uh, get the shapes of the different uh, variables, now the ST and rapidity. Now, the last thing that I wanted to show is what happens if I change technology. So instead of using a superconducting qubit system like uh, the Santiago, if I move to uh, an ion trapped, so where we have all the qubits talking to each other, for example, those from uh, IonQ, uh, does the results change? And this is the last slide where I show that, uh, in fact, in the first line, you have the IonQ samples. 
and uh, in the second row, you have the IBM Q samples. And in both cases, both technologies are quite okay. So you can get the distribution that you have trained. Uh, the, the statistics are limited because, you know, we have to pay, <laughs> that's the point. So you can only do a limit amount of samples. And this was done with the CERN uh, QTI, the Quantum Technology Initiative uh, program. So even though uh, we can do something, so you can observe the results, but the quality is somehow to be improved. You, know, you have a lot of uh, outliers in, in, in regions in the space that, uh, that could be improved. If we can have a better understanding of noise, if you could implement the noise correction algorithms, or if we could also define better architectures that incorporate noise. And with that, I arrive to my outlook. So I, I hope that um, I managed to explain a little bit what we, try, we are trying to do. So we're trying to find a prototype, understand if this prototype is feasible in, uh, in, the, real, in the real world. Simulation works. Deployment is what we saw before. So we have to work on that. But in terms of applications, this particular approach could be eventually interesting in the future. Now, if you had a, the opportunity to, to design or build your quantum hardware, you know, deployment of generative models is somehow something is somehow possible, I would say. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Question there. <laughs> Hello. Perfect. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, could you elaborate a little, bit, a little bit more how you embed these data into circuits than how you train, not, not the training part, yeah. but the, how you form the circuits actually, like for the 3D correlated Gaussian or, or these, it doesn't matter, any, yeah. any one of them. Yeah, yeah. No, what happens is that uh, what we are doing is that we are using a single qubit for the mesh, per dimension. So for the, for example, this one, the simplest one, you take the single qubit and we perform a measurement. The final measurement should contain the number that you put in this plot to generate the histogram. So you sample the circuit several times, in particular in the left 10 to the four times, and then you can uh, plot the, the, the blue histogram. Okay, so this is exactly what it is, very simple. You just take the output from the quantum hardware. Um, now, when you ask about the parameterization, so the parameterization is, uh, for, for this model, what happens is that the Z number that you see here is a um, Gaussian random distribution. So, and this is what we have used to, to train our generative model, is what happens also in the classical equivalent. No, you have a random noise and you can change it. You can use a uniform Gaussian and then, Usually, if you do a retraining, you can get a good, uh, good results. Modulo, if the architecture is acceptable. Okay, I hope this. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I have a, yeah. a general question, which is not restricted to quantum, but I have a problem with GANs in Monte Carlo simulations mm -hmm. because how do you control the bias? I, I'm coming from lattice field theories when we want to have the exactly uh, probability distribution. Yeah. And here you, you don't control that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, is, is, or how do you control? How do you control? Yeah. Yeah, it's a trick question because in, indeed is uh, I, I think there are two. Well, first point is uh, as a theoretician, I would say that uh, we are doing Monte Carlo. So using Vegas or doing the exact computation, this generates an error, a variance. And if you could compare this variance to the output of a neural network uh, sampling, then we have an answer. We have at least a reference to, to compare with. So all these papers, they try to do this approach. You know? They try to compare and tell you that, uh, okay, in regions where I have a lot of statistics, I, I am within the Monte Carlo and I can accelerate my, my, my sample. But, uh, but I agree that it's a tricky, very tricky problem, in particular, if you start asking predictions in regions where there is uh, very few points. No? So you have to be careful. Now, so if you revert to the question to, are those models useful for us? I would say that um, if you are planning to do transfer learning or to train in a very simple set of data, you know, take a Higgs and uh, dif diphotons and then propagate it to another process, this might have some value because it uh, helps a lot to accelerate. Uh, but if you are looking for a special for BSM or other 
the corners of the phase space that requires a lot of statistics, then you have to really make sure that the model is, uh, say, able to learn the underlying distribution in the full regime that we're looking for. And this is not a materiality at all. No. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I would have a question. A question uh, here. For the, okay. Yeah. Thank you for the talk. I still want to understand whether. Uh, let's look at this slide. Uh, uh, do you sample x or do you sweep x, and for each x you get a probability? Um, so what happens is that uh, I I no I have a model the quantum circuit to deliver me the x that you see in this plot. So the circuit will give me the number in the x-axis. And then I do the histogram just to show you the cumulative value. Ah, OK. okay. But, 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 this number a, is, but this yeah. number is continuous, so to speak. Yeah, and, it's continuous. So and the measurements are discrete. So, so how does this map? So maybe I was missing something. So yes, this is yeah. Yeah, 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 sure. It's here. So here you have the projection that we do to the final state. So we are using the Z Pauli matrix taking as a, an output the um, uh, the state you know, that we can uh, obtain after sampling. Uh, and that will be the binary representation of the number x? Is that the point? Yes, yes. This will give ah, okay, you a continuous, okay. this gives you a, a continuous number. The choice of a sigma Pauli is just a choice. You can do any other Hamiltonian that you, that you wish. But at the end of the day, the nice feature is that uh, the quantum circuit produces a kinematics configuration in a very similar way to the classical equivalent. Mm -hmm. okay. okay the last one i i'm going to just ask the same question again because yeah, sure. i feel like i'm still not getting it Go um ahead. a you have a three qubit circuit so the measurement that you get out of it in the day is some bind some binary measurement in some in the computational basis mm -hmm. so how does that get transformed into a continuous number hey you can co you can compute the expectation value of your hamiltonian using the frequencies that you have measured okay so to get a continuous number you have to take multiple shots of the same circuit with yeah. the same parameterization yes okay so it's not that you get a single sample per run of no, the no, no 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 single get a sample is actually yeah, yes, like exactly. thousands of shots or exactly exactly okay exactly. okay that's yeah. i understand exactly. yeah Okay. Speak it again. Thank you.